Okay. So welcome to the second workshop of the spring 2021 introduction to data science uh, workshop series put on by the KAUST Visualization Core Laboratory and the um, KAUST Core Labs. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the KAUST Visualization Core Laboratory, KVL, and also a certified uh, instructor with software carpentry and data carpentry. So software and data carpentry are global nonprofit uh, organizations whose goals are to teach foundational um, computing, data science and machine learning skills to um, students, academics, researchers, um, both in academia and industry. And there are workshops and workshop series held all over the world. And um, if you would like to know more about them, I encourage you just to give Google on uh, software carpentry or data carpentry and their web pages will come up and you can read more um, about, uh, about their activities. Right, so today we're gonna to be doing an introduction to Conda uh, for data science and data scientists. So let me share my screen and here we go. So uh, Conda is an open source package and environment management system. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, it allows you to install, run, update packages and their dependencies. Um, it allows you to create, save, and switch between something called Conda environments or virtual environments. We're gonna talk more about what those are later um, on your local computer. Although it was created for Python, it works um, for potentially any language. So R, Ruby, Lua, Scala, um, Java, C++, Fortran. And this is one of the, the real benefits of, of Conda, particularly for doing uh, machine learning, data science, software, or scientific computing, where it's typically a multi-language um, software stack that needs to be managed. Um, Many scientific computing applications under the hood are running in C++ or Fortran, and you are interacting with that C++ or Fortran code via Python. Um, if you're doing bioinformatics or genomics, you might be using um, you know, tools that are written in Java, C++, Ruby, and Python, and you need to be able to install and manage all of those tools. So the ability to use a tool like Conda to manage multiple programming languages is a huge benefit. Although today we're going to be focusing almost entirely on its ability to manage uh, Python code or Python code that is wrapping C++ or Fortran code. Okay. Um, so we're going to cover, I think, four out of the five lessons um, today. We're going to talk about how to get started with Conda. So that's the basics. Um, how to work with environments, um, how to use packages and channels, and how to share environments. And I'm going to leave the fifth um, episode, which is on managing uh, NVIDIA GPU libraries using Conda as kind of an exercise for those of you who are interested in working with GPUs. You can, by the time we get there, um, you will have all of the, the skills that you need to manage the GPU dependencies. It's just a matter of learning kind of what those dependencies are and what versions you might need, depending on what you want to do, things like that. So I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader or viewer in this case. Okay. So let's, let's get started with Conda. Okay. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about what is Conda, and then I'm going to talk about why you should use a package and environment management system as part of your research workflow. And then we're going to talk about why you should use Conda in particular. And um, I want you to have some sense of the problems that, uh, that Conda is solving for you. Um, so you have some appreciation of the complexity that is involved uh, and kind of how useful having a tool like Conda uh, can be. Okay, so let's get started with that. So packages. So when you're working with a programming language such as Python, um, you know, Python itself is, is very small. Like you can go and install Python from many places. Um, and Python has a lot of libraries and things that come with it as part of its so-called standard library. 
Um, but the real power of, um, of Python is this whole ecosystem of libraries and packages that have been created by uh, the Python community and made available for use um, by anybody who can, uh, who can download them. Um, but that's, uh, that's quite complicated. Or the process of downloading the software can be quite complicated. And, and thus, we need a tool like Conda to help us manage that complexity. OK, so one of the things about um, the complexity is that um, it's not just you might want to install a particular package like NumPy for doing uh, array computing in Python or SciPy, which is kind of like a, a MATLAB um, NumPy and SciPy together act as almost an open source MATLAB uh, clone within the Python community. Um, but those packages have other packages that they need in order to function. Those are called dependencies. And each of these packages has a version, and all of the dependencies of the packages have their own versions. And all of these versions need to be compatible. Like They need to be able to work, uh, work together. And not all versions of every package or library can work together with all the versions of other packages and libraries. So there is this kind of um, problem of making sure that you have you know, not only like the most recent versions of the packages you care about, like maybe NumPy or SciPy or Matplotlib, which is a plotting library that we're going to, uh, we're going to work with, but then the versions of the packages that those are the versions of the uh, dependencies of those packages. So Conda is going to help us manage this dependency, uh, the dependencies of the packages that we care about, in addition to managing the packages that we want to install. Now, one of the ways that Conda is going to do this is with the concept of an environment. So instead of just installing software onto our system, whether it's a laptop, a workstation, or remote cluster, what have you, we're going to create kind of isolated um, environments. An environment is, is really just going to be a, a directory and a file system. Um, and then into that directory in the file system, we're going to install all of the software in that, in that same directory. And that's going to allow us to um, isolate the software that we're installing from other things that are on your, uh, are on your machine. So there's no, there's no conflicts or issues with, um, with you know, you install some Python libraries that you need to do your data science projects, and all of a sudden that corrupts your operating system. No, we're going to install into a separate environment so that your operating system is isolated from any changes that um, that we're going to make by installing software with with a tool like Conda. And also, with these different environments, it's going to allow you to have different versions of the same library, which is something that that can be quite difficult. Um, if you're not using a tool like Conda. So, um, you know, around say three to five years ago, um, there was a lot of software that would only work with Python 2 and then a lot of newer software which would only work with Python 3. And so it was fairly common to need both Python 2 and Python 3 installed on your computer um, in order to use the different packages you might want to use. And that was very common. That is, nearly impossible to do without a tool um, that is managing separate isolated environments like Conda does. OK. Um, there are several environment management systems for Python. Um, and there are some links here, uh, virtual environment, uh, pipin, vim, pyim. Um, they all have their, their various trade-offs. Um, one of the and one of the big reasons why I um, am focusing on Conda instead of these others is that these other environment management systems are very much focused on the Python ecosystem. And as I mentioned earlier, when you're doing uh, scientific computing or data science or machine learning, it's not just Python that you're typically going to care about, but also um, you know, several other programming languages. And so you'll need to be able to manage software for these different programming languages, um, including uh, things like GPU dependencies, uh, which are very important for deep learning um, or um, more advanced applications of machine learning. 
but there are links here if you want to go and look at those different uh, uh, those different options. Okay. Um, so package management. So I mentioned environments. So now we're going to talk about packages. So within an environment, we still have to, once we've figured out um, a way to use a tool like Conda to isolate uh, different uh, application stacks inside environments, then we still need to install and manage all the packages that we want to install inside those environments. Um, and we want all of the complexity of that, like make sure, making sure that all the packages that we install within a particular environment are going to work well together. We want that to be managed by um, a tool like Conda. We don't want to have to like manually keep track of all of those things because that's real. That would be a real challenge. Um, so if you're if you've used a Linux computer before, so you'll be very familiar with the idea of package management because each Linux distribution has their own operating system level package manager. Um, it's apt on Ubuntu or yum on CentOS. Um, Mac has something similar called homebrew. Um, and then if you're a Windows user, I think Windows now in new very new versions of Windows, they have the concept of a Windows kind of package manager. Um, that is built in, but I'm not really terribly familiar with it. Um, so there are some other package management systems for Python. So pip uh, is one that we're going to talk about later. Um, and then poetry uh, is another one. But again, these focus on solving the problem of package management just within the Python community. And uh, whereas a tool like Conda is going to allow us to solve this package management problem uh, more uh, more broadly. Okay. So now, why should you use uh, a package in environment management system? So a typical um, way to go about a, a software installation is you just find some software on the internet, you install it on your computer, following whatever instructions are provided by the author of that software, uh, which might be very detailed or might be very sparse. And you just kind of left to you install that on your own uh, your own laptop. Um, this is this creates a number of of, of issues. Um, one is that if you're doing research, whether you know it's in academia or an in industry, it becomes very difficult to figure out what software is actually required to uh, draw to obtain the results of your research project because you've just installed stuff on your computer. And without any kind of environment isolation for that project, basically you need all the software that's installed on your computer potentially to generate the results of your research project, which is not, um, not a great position to be in. Um, also, when you're installing things system-wide, it makes it very impossible or very difficult, if not impossible, to install different versions of the same software package at the same time. So different versions of Python, different versions of the important libraries that you want to use. If you don't use some kind of environment isolation um, tool, then you, it's difficult to have these different versions installed. Um, a big one that I run into a lot uh, with users who are not using something like, uh, like Conda is that they install software for one project, then they're working on a new project, they install new software for that project, and then they go back to try to, to use their software for their old project, and it doesn't work because without some concept of environment isolation, then there's no way for um, you to know that when you've installed software for a new project, it has overwritten or somehow broken software that used to work for your old project. So that's a, that's a huge pain point that um, is, um, can be completely avoided by using a tool like Conda that manages uh, software environments. Okay. So what is Conda? So um, if you have ever encountered kind of Conda before, there is a bit of confusion around Conda, mini Conda, and Anaconda. So um, Conda itself is a tool that is that manages uh, package installation and environment and virtual environments. Um, so that's the tool. So we're going to learn to use that tool today. So Miniconda is a distribution of that tool. And Miniconda contains the Conda tool plus a version of Python and then some base packages which depend on your operating system. So Conda needs to interact with your operating system, whether it's Mac, Linux, or Windows. 
in order to function. And it also doesn't want to use your system version of Python. Um, so it will install its own version of Python and these base packages so that it can interact with the operating system, which it needs to do when it creates environments or when it, it downloads and installs software. Then there is Anaconda, which is another distribution of Python um, and the Conda tool that includes everything in Miniconda, but then also several hundred um, packages that are commonly used um, within data science, scientific computing, and machine learning communities in particular. And I encourage you to install Miniconda, and I provide you kind of links and everything to install Miniconda. You can install Anaconda, um, but what I have found when working with users with Anaconda is that they typically end up installing all of their software into a, a, a single kind of base environment. And that kind of defeats the purpose of using Conda as an environment management tool and, use, and is using Conda only as a package management tool. And it can lead to a lot of, um, of difficulties and slow uh, uh, poor performance of environment uh, creation and software installation down the line. So I just encourage everyone to install Miniconda and then um, and then follow the practices I'm going to teach you this afternoon. And then we are, um, and then you'll be headed off in the right direction, I think. OK. Um, so why should you use, uh, why should you use Conda? So, um, so for scientific computing, machine learning, and data science, so Conda is really um, focused particularly at supporting uh, those users. Um, it helps install really complicated software that, um, that needs to be pre-compiled and has a very long or difficult to get up and running um, compilation step, which is very common in scientific software. Um, this happens with um, astronomy and geoscience um, or with TensorFlow, which is a tool for, uh, for deep learning. Um, and so Conda distributes pre-compiled binaries. And so there's no need to basically solve this difficult compilation problem yourself on your own computer. Um, works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and then it also works with other um, uh, package management tools such as PIP. And we'll talk about exactly how to do that later. Um, and then also it makes it very easy to get um, accelerated versions of the low-level libraries used by NumPy and SciPy, TensorFlow, um, that are hardware-specific libraries um, without having to change your code, basically. OK, so I think I'm just going to stop sharing briefly. I think there are some questions in the chat. OK, so this is a, a great question. So Fernando is asking, so what happens if I installed Anaconda before and then I install Miniconda? Will I have different Python versions? Um, so what will probably happen is that you will have in your home directory, you will have an Anaconda directory and a Miniconda directory. And whichever um, you installed second, so in this case, if it was Miniconda, the Miniconda would probably be the default conda that you would uh, the conda installed within Miniconda would then be the default version that you would be using. Um, and then nothing about your previous Anaconda installation will have like gone away or been overwritten or anything. You'll just have two of these. So I would encourage you in general to avoid doing that um, if possible. In the setup instructions, it talks about how to remove um, Miniconda or Anaconda. It basically just involves deleting a directory. Um, so if you had Anaconda installed before, then I, that's fine. You could just use Anaconda, um, you know, keep it up to date, make sure it has the most recent um, version of Conda. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. Um, but uh, you don't need to, and I would encourage you maybe either remove Anaconda and then install Miniconda, or just update your Anaconda and make sure it's, it's, it's recent. OK, but good question, uh, Fernando. Any other questions? OK, cool. So let's jump to the next episode. So this first episode was a bit 
a bit wordy. The next episodes are going to be um, more hands-on. Okay, so this episode is how to work with uh, how to work with environments, and we're going to cover all the basics for creating environments, deleting environments. We'll talk about why you need to activate your environments, which is, which is basically switching between environments. We'll see how to do that. We're going to install lots of packages. Um, we're going to talk about where you might want to create your environments um, and where the default location is. Um, and then we're going to see commands for kind of inspecting your environments to see what's already been installed, what environments exist, and then we'll talk about environment deletion. Okay. Um, now, in your um, Jupyter uh, lab, so I have already created, in the lecture notes, it mentions that you might want to create this introduction to Conda for data scientists directory on your desktop. You know, if we were teaching this live and everyone was using their local computers, then they would need to do that. Um, but I've already done that for you in this cloud instance. Um, so I think my Binder Hub instance might have died on me because it doesn't seem to be working. So what I will do is I will just close it and I will go back and get another one. So if your binder instance has gone idle or, or timed out, then you can just go back to the GitHub repo and then just click the relevant button again. And after a few seconds, you'll get your, your compute environment back. There we go. So in here is the introduction to Conda directory. So I've already created that for you. Um, so if you just double click on it, then um, It'll be, you'll be kind of navigated into that directory, so to speak. Okay. Um, okay, so what is a con environment? So a con environment is just a directory that contains a specific collection of conda packages that we're going to install. Um, these could be things like NumPy uh, or SciPy or Matplotlib or, or, or Python. Um, and everything is going to be installed inside this directory. We'll talk later about the structure of the directory, the more details uh, about what that looks like. Um, but just know that it's a, you know, a folder on your file system. That's all the directory is. Okay. So if we open a terminal, I'm just going to make that go away. And so I'm going to assume that you have at least a little bit of familiarity with, um, with some of the bash commands that we talked about last week, like PWD for printing the working directory. So we are in our, our home directory here. Um, and um, you know, other commands, as we, as we encounter them, I'll kind of quickly mention what they are. But I kind of expect that you will have some familiarity with the, bash, the basics of bash that we, that we talked about last week. OK, so the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to create a, uh, um, we're going to create a conda environment uh, for Python 3. So we're going to use the, uh, the conda command. So if we type conda dash dash help, then conda is already installed in your, um, in your cloud your cloud instance, and this is the help menu. And it talks about all the different subcommands that you can run, um, and then how you can check your version. So if we do conda and either dash dash version or conda dash capital V for the short form of that pack, we can see that we're using conda 4.9.2. And, um, and then if we wanted to look at the help menus of these other commands, which we'll do in a minute, we can you know, look at these commands and then um, and uh, well, I'll look, we'll look at them in a minute. So the first one that we're going to use is conda create. So let's just create an environment. So I'm going to type clear to clear out space. So we're going to do conda create, and we're going to provide a name for our environment, and we'll call it um, Python 3 environment, and then we're going to install Python. And then if you hit enter. So what Conda does is it checks 
which um, it checks the software that you've asked to install and it goes off and collects all of the required dependencies for that piece of software. And then it comes back with what's called a package plan. And the package plan tells you where the environment is going to be installed. So this is the absolute path. Remember from last week, it starts with a slash. So it's an absolute path from the root of the file system down to some directory. And the directory's name is going to have the same name that you provided here. So in this case, Python 3-env, Python 3n. And then it is going to tell you the packages that need to be downloaded. So note that we just specified Python and nothing else. And we also didn't specify a version number. So what Conda does by default is it goes through and it gets the most recent version of the package that you asked for, in this case, Python 3.9.2 and then finds all of these other libraries that need to be installed because they are key dependencies of Python for your operating system. So we're all using Linux because we're running in the cloud. Um, so we all have the same operating system. So we should all see similar, if not identical, list of packages here. But if you, if you ran the same command on Windows or on, on Mac, you would see slightly different uh, output here. And all of these packages are dependencies of Python. You don't need to know what they are necessarily what they do. It's just that they're required uh, in order to install Python on your operating system. So these are what packages will be downloaded. And then this is the list of packages that will be installed. Sometimes when you have multiple environments, um, the list of packages to be downloaded will be um, much shorter than the list of packages that will be installed. And the reason for that is uh, Conda does a lot of caching to save space. So if a new environment needs exactly the same version of a software that you have already downloaded on your computer, it doesn't re-download it again. It just uses the, the previously cached version or the, the previously downloaded version in the new environment. Okay. So, um, And if you just hit uh, enter again, then Conda will start downloading and extracting the packages. And um, so this is a good time to point out that um, when you are, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. There we go. So when you are using Conda, you need to have an internet connection in order to download the software. But then once the software has been downloaded, you can use it on your computer without having to have access to uh, an internet connection. So, but you will need access to the internet connection to download the software to begin with. So that's, so that's something to remember. And that's it. So now we're done and we're, we're given a, um, um, some commands to activate the environment or to deactivate an active environment. We'll talk about that in a minute, but that's it. So you've created your first Conda environment. So let's try to create another one. So we created this previous, so if you press the up key, um, then you can go back to the most recent command that you've, you've run. So we didn't provide a version number and we saw that Conda just went and downloaded the most recent uh, available version of that package. So, but what if we wanted to install a particular version of Python? So Python um, 3.6 is uh, a very popular version of Python. Um, so we can install uh, Python 3.6 by putting an equal sign and then the version number that we want to install. So 3.6, 3.6. Now we need to change our environment name. So we'll call this Python 3.6 environment. You can name your environments whatever you want. I try to have meaningful names um, that are somewhat descriptive of, of what the environment contains so that it helps me, re helps me remember what the environment is supposed to be used for. Typically, my environments are project related. So my name will have the, will, the name of the environment will be related to the name of the project that I'm working on. So if we hit enter, so now Conda is going to be like, right, okay, so I need to install Python 3.6. 
So now if we look here, we'll see that it needs to download Python 3.6.13. So that's the most recent version of Python 3.6. And then a few other libraries that Python 3.6 needs that maybe are different versions than the same libraries up here used by um, Python uh, 3.9, for example. Yeah, so here's Python underscore ABI for 3.9. And if you look down here, that needs a different version, Python ABI 3.6. But some of the other packages that we've already downloaded for a more recent version of Python are perfectly acceptable for this older version of Python. And then here, the number of packages that were going to be installed is basically going to be the same kinds of packages that were installed for the other version of Python. So we'll just go ahead and hit Y for yes and hit enter. And now we're going to create this environment for Python 3.6. I think I have a question in the chat. Let's see. So Farouk asks, you use dash dash name to name the environment. Does this mean there are other options to include when creating an environment? Indeed, there are. In fact, there are several different ways to create an environment, and we're going to see that later. But if you use the conda uh, create uh, command and help, then you can see the help menu. And you can see that typically you need to provide either the name of an environment or the path or the prefix, which is the, uh, the path to the location where you want to create the environment directory. And we're going to talk a lot about that because actually my preferred way to create environments is to use the prefix. But the create environments by name is the easier way to kind of get everybody started. Okay. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other um, other options here that you can use um, to see, you know, what you what you might want to do, um, inc including a way to clone an environment, an existing environment, um, which we might talk about later, and then some other more advanced uh, advanced features. Okay, so that's it. So now we've created um, two different environments. Um, a Python, uh, a most a Python environment that has the most recent version of Python, and then a, a, a Python environment that has a very particular version of Python. Okay. So I would encourage you to, in most all cases, you should specify the version numbers of the packages that you want to install. Um, that's a good practice because you helps you to know exactly what you're installing. Um, it also helps Conda be a little bit uh, faster to build environments um, by giving it extra information about what particular environment or versions you want to install. It makes it easier for Conda to figure out what versions of the dependencies of those packages it needs to install. Now, but if you're going to use, if you, if you need to specify the version number, then of course you have to know what the version number is. And so how do you know what the version number of it is? Well, there's a cool command um, called Conda search so if you do conda and then search and then the name of a package that you want to uh, that you want to look for, um, let's try uh, scikit learn, which is the kind of uh, uh, most commonly used package for doing machine learning in the Python community. And there's going to be a training um, in late March on uh, on introduction to machine learning with scikit learn. But if we do conda search in scikit learn. Then Conda is going to go out and find all of the available versions of Scikit-Learn that you could possibly install. And it, it has to go through and search all of the, the different channels that it knows about. We'll talk about channels, Conda channels um, later this afternoon. Um, but you'll see it loading channels and searching channels and things like that as it goes through and it, it thinks about what it's doing. Um, and once this is done, which hopefully won't take too much longer, there we go, um, you'll see all of the different versions of scikit-learn that are available. And you can scroll back and see that actually there's a fair number of them, going back um, a couple of years, probably. And one of the things you'll notice is actually, well, if you look at the most recent version of scikit-learn, 
there are whoop, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different versions of the same version. Whoa, what's going on there? Um, well, if you look closely at the, the third column, you'll see that these numbers are different and they correspond to different builds of the package. And you'll see that usually the, the convention for build numbers is that they have a Python version that they correspond to. So there's a Python 3.9, 3.8, 3.7 and 3.6. And then why there are two builds for 3.6 and 3.7, I am not certain. But um, that's where the, why you'll see multiple uh, listings for the same version number. And fortunately for you, Conda is gonna figure out exactly which of these versions needs to be installed and which of the builds of a particular version need to be installed. So there's another question in chat um, from Sahar. If, uh, there's no dependency between the package. This will kind of generate an alarm or fix this automatically. So if there is, um, if there is no dependencies between the packages, then there's not going to be an issue. Conda will just download the packages and everything will be fine. If there's dependencies between the packages that Conda can resolve, like it can find versions of the dependencies that will work together, it will install them, and all will be fine. If Conda cannot find a set of dependencies that are mutually consistent, that will work with one another, then it will raise an error and stop. And we'll see some examples of that uh, later today, and we'll talk about um, approaches for dealing with that problem. So that's a good question. Okay, so let's do something a little bit more um, um, more advanced. So we're going to create another environment. Um, so I'm going to clear this out. So I know that the here we have some particular version numbers, but I think these version numbers might be getting a bit dated. So I'm going to just use this command without the version numbers um, to kind of see what versions get installed when I run this command. So I'm going to do conda create. And I'm going to create a basic uh, SciPy environment. And this environment is going to have uh, several packages. So I'm going to install um, IPython and, and, okay. So in order to kind of make things show up on my screen, I'm going to use a uh, the slash to indicate that I'm going to write a multi-line command in bash. And so this just means that I can list um, the command, the packages on a separate lines, which will make it a little bit easier for you to read given the limited space for my terminal. NumPy and then, is that it? And SciPy. And now the last one, I just don't hit a, I don't put a slash and that lets um, Bash know that I'm done with the command. And it, then it will pretend that I wrote that all in the same line, basically. And so now we're going to install um, not just Python, um, but uh, a bunch of other things as well. And actually, if you'll notice, I didn't even list Python. Here, I listed IPython, which is short for interactive uh, Python. So it's a different implementation of Python, but I didn't actually list the Python programming language. But if you look through here, so there's some new packages that had to be downloaded, including, um, so IPython 7.20. And then um, uh, these are in alphabetical order. So here's uh, matplotlib 3.3, uh, numpy 1.2, and then SciPy 1.6. And then all of the rest of these packages that are being downloaded are dependencies of those four packages or five packages. Okay, including, um, well, Python didn't need to be downloaded um, because we had already downloaded it before. And Conda is just gonna use the previously downloaded version. But if we go and look and see what packages will be installed, you know, we can find like matplotlib and all of the um, all of the packages that we listed. 
um, as well as uh, Python, for example. So it's using Python 3.9. So that's the previously installed version of Python 3.9. Okay. And then we just say yes. What is going on here? Uh, hmm, I see that I have lost my Jupyter. That's odd. We'll get another one. So hopefully I'm the only one that is having to keep opening their, uh, their Jupyter labs. Um, but so now what I'll need to do is I'm not going to install, um, I'm not going to install those previous, uh, again, I'm just going to do the basic, uh, uh, the basic SciPy. So conda create name, uh, basic SciPy environments, and then IPython matplotlib numpy scipy. So while this is running again, so uh, Dahlia asks, would you please elaborate on why Miniconda is preferred than Anaconda, or are there specific use cases to each? So um, I'm encouraging Miniconda um, because as we'll see later this afternoon, Miniconda is going to encourage you to follow a project-based um, environment management um, workflow. So for each new project, you're going to have your own environment. Or each project is going to have its own environment, its own Conda environment. And this kind of project-specific software stack, I have personally found to be very useful. And many of the um, users and clients that I work with have also found it to be a useful way of organizing their workflow. And Miniconda forces you to move in that direction because it only installs Conda and the basic packages that Conda needs to interact with your operating system. If you install Anaconda, you get a base environment that has Conda, those base um, operating system specific packages, but then 300 other packages. And what I find a lot of people do with Anaconda is they have this base environment that has most of what they need, which is uh, gets them started more quickly, perhaps. But then what they end up doing is just installing everything else into that base environment. So every time they need a new library, they just install it into that environment. And over time, that environment just gets huge and it gets difficult to install everything and um, uh, efficiently. And you lose track of like what actually is being used on your projects because you're just using this one mega environment. Now, if you've installed Anaconda, you can still follow the project specific workflow that I'm going to advocate. Um, and so it's, it's okay to have installed Anaconda. It's just that Anaconda makes it like uh, a bit too easy to kind of head down the wrong path, in my opinion. So for those of you who are new and getting started, I'm trying to kind of help you learn from my mistakes by pushing you off in a, an opinionated direction to use Miniconda that I think will um, benefit you uh, going forward. Okay, so now that that's done, um, so Mohammed has a question. Can we see the list of packages included in the environment again? Um, and then Sam is saying, all the packages shown on your screen does not appear the same on my screen. Um, so there could be, a, the, the reason for that is I just had to restart my, um, I had to restart my Jupyter lab, which meant that I lost all the other packages that had been previously installed in the Python environment and the Python 3.6 environment. And so I had to re-download everything again. So this is gonna look different than what it was before my Jupyter lab instance died, and what it probably looks like on your screen if you're still using the same Jupyter lab instance. Okay. Um, and we're going to see in a minute how to list what is list the contents of um, of an environment. Okay. 
So, so now we've created um, this new environment. So let's take, so I have another environment creation um, kind of exercise for you. So let's take a few minutes and go ahead and work through um, this uh, creating a new environment uh, exercise where you're going to create an environment called machine learning environment, machine learning in, include Python, and then the most current versions of IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, Numba, and Scikit-learn. Okay, so take, um, let's say three minutes and see if you can get that command uh, to work. So it's very similar to the one that we just ran. There are just a few more packages that, that you need to install. And then we'll go over that together. Set my timer, keep us on time. And in the meantime, then feel free to ask any questions um, that you might have in the chat or unmute yourself and I'll answer them whilst um, everyone is working on this exercise. And I will also do the exercise. And just as a note, so if you're not familiar with uh, what some of these packages do, then I've put links in the exercise to the, the home pages for those different packages. And um, I would encourage you to, to take a look at, um, at some of them. Um, in particular, let me share my screen. Uh, in particular, so uh, pandas, uh, number, and so I can't learn. So uh, pandas is the library for doing uh, data analysis in Python and for, of tabular, primarily of, of tabular data. So data that fits into like rows and columns, like a spreadsheet kind of thing. Um, and we're going to talk about how to use pandas uh, next week in the introduction to Python programming um, workshop. Um, Scikit-learn is, as I mentioned, a Python package for doing uh, machine learning. We're going to be talking about this in the introduction to machine learning with Scikit-learn episode, uh, just kind of scratching the surface with how to use uh, um, with how to use Scikit-learn, but enough to kind of get you started. Um, and then Numba is a really interesting package for um, doing something called just-in-time compiling or JIT compiling Python code down to low-level um, machine code as a way to accelerate your Python, uh, Python programs. Um, and if you have access to GPUs, you can actually use Numba to take your Python code and then compile it down to run on a GPU without you having to, to handle any of that yourself. You just write your Python function and then you compile it down to run on a GPU if you have access to one and you're good to go. And uh, so that's a, um, a particularly uh, important project to be aware of. If you're doing scientific computing um, or advanced data science or machine learning. Okay, so that was the timer that went off. Um, so let me just see. 
I thought I had a question in the chat. Um, okay, uh, so Salma asked a great question. Um, so is the my binder hub runs uh, um, is that something that I'm running on my site or can I continue to use my binder hub in the future? So you can continue to come back and use uh, this cloud computing environment as long as the binder project is running, which basically means as long as they have access to the um, you know, free cloud computing resources. And it's been running as a, as a nonprofit foundation for several years now, and I would expect it to continue to run for the foreseeable future. So um, it's a great way to get access to um, uh, free cloud computing resources. So in particular, if you want to come back and watch this video and go over some of the same things that we're doing again, uh, with the cloud computing environment, you can just come back and click the public uh, JupyterLab or Binder Hub button here and get access to cloud computing resources and do it again. And then uh, Sahar asks, Um, basically, is there some way to define the version based on the project or is there a better way? Okay, so what we're going to see um, after the break uh, this afternoon is how to basically have a single text file called an environment file where we specify packages and version numbers. And each project has its own environment file and then you can create your content environment from that text file. And that's going to be kind of the best way to, to solve that problem of of remembering and having a record of what versions uh, of what packages are used on a particular project. Okay. Okay. So the, let me just, so let's just walk through the, the solution here. So if you click the little down arrow, you'll get kind of the solution. Um, and both one that includes no version numbers, and then one that includes version numbers. Uh, but these version numbers, I think, are a bit dated um, relative to what I think we're going to see installed here. Um, but if we go and look, so here is uh, here's my solution. So again, you're just listing the packages that you want to install. It's the same command, and then I, I change the environment name. And then we can see kind of what packages are going to be downloaded. So NumPy, Numba, then NumPy gets downloaded because it's a dependency of both Numba and Pandas um, and Matplotlib. Um, and then all the software that's being installed. And then we download everything and then we're done. Okay, so it's the same kind of pattern that we've seen before. Okay, so we've got some practice creating environments. So now we're going to activate an environment. So, what does it mean to activate an environment? So activating environments is kind of what it means to switch between these different environments. So we've created, you know, two or three different environments now. And, and if we want to use the software that's installed in a particular environment, we need to activate it first. And the way that we do that is by um, providing the name. So if we do conda act, activate, and then let me clear this out. If we do conda activate, and then the name of the environment that we want to activate, so basic SciPy environment, for example, then we will, our prompt will change and we'll be given kind of the name of the environment here. And so that's how we know that that's the environment that's active. Um, and if we want to deactivate the environment, we just use the conda deactivate command. And now we're back into um, the environment that we were in before we launched, which was actually this notebook environment, um, which is something that is bundled in with Binder. So that's kind of actually the Conda environment. So Binder is using Conda as well. And so the notebook environment is the Binder uh, default environment, basically. Okay. Sammy, how can I look at all environments installed? Great question. Um, in fact, we are going to get to that in just a couple of minutes. So the answer is um, there's a couple of ways to do it, but one way is to do conda environment list. And then this lists all of the all of the environments that you have installed and then puts this little star next to 
the currently active environment. So if we were to do conda activate, so the exercise in the lecture notes over here asks you to practice activating the machine learning environment. But if we were to activate the uh, machine learning environment, then we'll see that the machine learning environment is active. And if we were to run this conda environment list command again, we'll see that now there's the star next to the machine learning environment. Now, you will probably have more environments listed there than I do. And that's because, again, my JupyterLab crashed on me and I lost the Python environment and the Python 3.6 environment. So don't be confused if you have, uh, or don't be surprised, rather, if you have extra environments. OK. So we've talked about creating environments from a, a, a specified list of packages. But what happens if we um, what happens if we uh, want to install a package into an environment that already exists? Well, um, let's let's see how to do that. So we're going to go ahead and deactivate because I was in the machine learning environment, and so let's activate the basic SciPy environment. Now, the basic SciPy environment does not include uh, Numba. So Numba was not, um, um, was not included in this package. So but we can install it into the active environment by doing conda install Numba. And this is going to install Numba into the basic SciPy environment, which is the currently active environment. So in order to do that, Conda has to check and see whether it can install Numba. Um, it can install whether it can install Numba um, uh, into the environment, and so that's what it's doing. And um, so uh, Farouk asks how to list the currently installed packages in the environment. So we'll get to that in a second. If you want to just kind of move ahead a little bit further down in the episode, you'll find the answer to that uh, uh, answer to that question. So Dahlia is asking, do you recommend using Conda to install packages over PIP? Um, yes, I do. So we have there's a section on PIP that we'll get to later this afternoon uh, and how to use PIP efficiently with Conda. But um, what I recommend people do is Conda wherever possible and PIP only where necessary. And then if you're going to use PIP, then you should always um, install PIP into your Conda environment and then make sure that you're using that PIP to install uh, packages into that active environment. And we're going to talk about that and see examples of how to do that later. Um, but it's a good question. But I definitely recommend to prefer Conda relative to PIP. And the biggest reason for that is not that PIP is, is, uh, is a bad tool. It just has a more narrower focus than I think what is needed. So um, for, um, for Python uh, or for data science projects, Conda can handle not just your Python packages, but also other programming languages, but in particular GD, or, uh, GPU libraries. So with Conda, you can install you know, these other programming languages libraries that you need inside of an environment, whereas with PIP, you wouldn't be able to do that. You can only use PIP to install Python packages. And This seems to be taking longer than I was expecting. I'll let this run for a little bit longer and then we'll see. But, uh, OK, well, let's see how this goes. And then I'll keep going in the lecture notes, and then I'll come back to it when, it, when, it's, when it's done. 
Um, okay. So one of the things that when you're installing packages into, into a particular environment um, is that it might be the case that the package that you want to install into the environment requires not just like additional dependencies that have to be installed, but maybe newer, uh, newer versions of um, Uh, did I lose the connection? So Sammy thinks I may have, something might have happened with the, uh, right. Okay, I think you're right because I seem to have lost a connection. Okay, so let's try this. That didn't work. Hmm. All right, so I'm gonna close this and then I'm going to start using the public Jupyter lab and see if that uh, and see if that uh, behaves any differently. Ah. Okay. So uh, Junaid is getting an error. So this is an example of, um, yes, aha, okay. So, but now I've lost all my environments. So I need to quickly recreate them. So uh, conda environment, conda create, So now I've got to get caught up. But so, uh, so Junaid is uh, saying that she is getting um, an error. And it's the kind of error that you get when Conda cannot find a, um, um, cannot find a combination of packages that will work. And, um, and the reason is that in our, so here's the basic SciPy environment that I'm just installing now again. Um, and in here, there should be a Python, Python 3.9. So the issue and that what we'll see um, in a minute is that Numba requires, um, Numba is not yet uh, available for um, Python 3.9. And so we won't be able to install Numba into this environment um, because our Python version is too new. Hmm. So Muhammad is saying it worked for him. Well, let's see if it works for me. I'm uh, I'm expecting that it will not. Um, but we'll see. Okay. So then let's do conda activate basic SciPy environment. Clear this. And now let's do conda install number. Yeah, so mine is failing because it, the basic SciPy environment has Python 3.9 and um, uh, Numba requires um, Python 3.8 or older. And so Muhammad is saying it worked for him, um, but then he has Python 3.8.8. .8 .8. 
Um, so Mohammed, are you happen to be working on your own computer or are you working in the cloud? Hmm, he says on the binder version. Which binder version? The, uh, uh, okay, Mohammed thinks he sorted it out. Okay, so Vasim is asking a question. If we create uh, VM in Python, it creates a directory, but Inconda is not creating anything. Actually, Vasim, Inconda, what is it it's creating is a directory. And it's a directory that lives in a particular spot on your computer, but then you can control um, where the um, location of your environment gets installed. Um, and we're going to talk about how to do that in a minute. So it's, it's working in exactly the same way as VNV. Ah, so um, um, Muhammad said that he had inadvertently listed Numba, uh, perhaps instead of NumPy, uh, when he created the environment. And then Conda, of course, figured out that if I want to install Numba into the environment, then I can't install Python 3.9. So it installed an earlier version of Python, Python version 3.8. Okay, so I know that this is going to fail. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and just um, hit Control C. Um, and then just kill that process. Um, so instead, I will use, I'll, I'll go ahead and install scikit-learn. So that's something just to demonstrate uh, this technique. Um, I'll go ahead and install scikit-learn, since that will definitely install uh, into this. Um, And so, yes, so you can see it's doing kind of a similar thing. It's telling you that we're going to install into this environment. So, uh, Thassan, here's your uh, directory that um, contains our environment. And into that environment, we're going to install the scikit-learn package. And these are the packages that we're going to install. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit yes. Um, OK. Now there's another uh, exercise. So I want you to take three, uh, three minutes and install uh, Dask into the machine learning environment. And I'll use this time to get caught back up and create the machine learning environment again, and then install Dask. Uh, Dask is a library for scaling out your pandas and scikit-learn uh, code to run on um, potentially not just a single node, but on across multiple nodes in a computing cluster and potentially using GPUs that are distributed across multiple nodes in a cluster. Um, so, okay, so go ahead and get started on, on this exercise here, installing a package into a specific environment. I'll get caught back up by recreating the machine learning environment again, um, and then we'll pick up from there.
So Amani is asking a question, can we rename an environment? So that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure. Typically, if I want to rename an environment, I just, uh, just recreate the environment from scratch with a different name and would delete that environment, just recreate it. Um, but let's, uh, um, I will try to find out quickly while everyone is working on this exercise. So the answer to Amani's question about can you rename environment, the, the answer appears to be no, uh, you can't. Uh, this has been a much requested feature apparently, um, but you can't do it, it would seem. Um, I'll post a link that uh, Mohammed had found and sent to me privately, um, but it's just to a stack of post that uh, explains that no, it can't be done, but provides a, a workaround, which basically is delete and then reinstall. Um, there is possibly another way to do that um, using the using the uh, a command that I had mentioned before. We can try that now. Um, called a called the clone command. So that was my timer that just went off. So so let me share the screen again. So share. So there are a couple of ways that if I wanted to rename an environment, so I might try to do something. Um, something like the following. So let's do conda uh, deactivate for a minute. Um, so let's say I wanted to rename um, so anyway, so the, just quickly, so the link that I sent in chat takes you to this um, Stack Overflow post, which explains basically that you can't do it, but if you create a clone environment and then uh, remove the original one and provides a way to do that using this dash dash clone option. Um, and then you basically remove uh, the previous one. And there's some drawbacks to that, but that basically is the way to do it. So that's this command here. So we create with your new name and then clone using the old name. And if we look at our help menu, if you were to do uh, conda, create help, you can see that in here there is a, 
uh, where is it? Ah, dash dash clone. So basically, if you just provide the name of an environment, um, then you can create a copy of that environment and then with a different name. Uh, and then you'll want to delete that, that other environment. Okay, so I wanted to install Dask. So what I want to do, so Conda activate. So I installed the machine learning uh, environment uh, during the break or during the, while you guys were working on the exercise. And now I want to install Dask. So I just do, I activate the environment and then I do Conda install Dask. And then it's going to go and install, uh, install Dask. Uh, let's see. Chat. And I'm going to say yes. Let's do that. Okay. So while this is installing, so let's talk about where Conda environments live. So um, by default, so Conda environments have a, a special directory where they live. Um, and that's usually inside your, your username or in your home directory inside a Miniconda 3, or if you installed Anaconda, it might say Anaconda 3. Um, and inside that um, Miniconda 3 or Anaconda 3 directory is a slash ENVS directory. Um, and then um, in there is each of the the directories contain your different environments. And on Binder, because of the way that they've installed uh, Conda, it lives in a slightly different location because uh, they install it in a different place, a non-standard place, um, but it's still inside this EMVS directory. So for example, if we were to run the command ls to list the contents of the serve Conda EMVS directory, we would see that there are these environments. And so this is a, that's like a low level Unix way to look at what environments are available by just listing the directories that are inside the location specifying. Um, so there's some other questions I'm seeing in chat. I'll get to those in a minute. Um, Okay, so there's some questions about uh, could not find Conda environment machine learning uh, EMVS. So let's look at the, let's use the Conda env list command. So this will list the environments. So if you try to install Dask um, and you weren't able to um, activate the machine learning environment, it might be because you have a typo in what your the name, the environment you're trying to activate. So maybe instead of machine learning um, ENV, you wrote something else, something, maybe there was a typo in that, or maybe you put machine learning ENVS, something like this. So you should be able to run this command and then see what environments that have you have installed. Uh, and then find the one that looks like machine learning environment, or maybe you didn't install the machine learning environment, uh, which was a previous exercise. Um, so you might need to go back and install it if it doesn't show up in the list here. Okay, so there were some questions of earlier about like where, how do you install con environments in a particular location? Okay, so let's see how to, uh, let's see how to do that. Um, so let's do pwd. So I'm in my home directory. So let's, um, okay. So I'm going to deactivate. Uh, that's not spelled correctly. Deactivate. Um, and then I'm going to change directory into the introduction to conda directory. And then I'll do pwd. Okay. So let's suppose I wanted to create an environment in a particular location, not by name. So I'll do conda create. And now I'm going to create, instead of a name, I'm going to provide a prefix. And the prefix is going to be the, 
the path to the directory that I want to create for my environment. And I'll just do that by using, um, so there is a, let me just get rid of this. So from last week, um, uh, we talked about a command called echo. So there is a shell variable called PWD, which is stores the value of the current directory, your working directory. It's what gets returned when you type the command PWD. Yeah. So what I'll do is I will create, and I'll pass the prefix PWD slash env. And this command is equivalent to the one in the, um, in the lecture notes that just uses the dot to refer to the current working directory and then to create an env directory inside that current working directory. So you can do it whichever way you please. And then inside this environment, I'm going to install ipython, uh, matplotlib, uh, what else did I want to install? Um, pandas. And this is all running over again. Make it a little bigger and then hit enter. Okay. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to create, if I open this up and I look inside here, in a minute, it's going to create a directory called env inside introduction to conda. And that directory is going to contain all of the, the software that we're about to install. So there's the env directory. And when this is done, I'll open that and then we'll see what files have been created in there. Okay. And we're done. So then if we look in here, so you can see, woof, like, so this is the structure of a Conda environment um, directory. You don't need to know what these things are or like what the subdirectories are. Just know that like the a Conda environment is a directory and it has a particular structure that you don't really need to be too concerned about unless you want to build your own Conda packages, which is a whole separate uh, discussion. Okay, but now what if we want to activate this? So we, instead of providing a name, we provide the, the path to the environment we want to activate. So we could, again, we could do that using uh, pwd slash env. And notice that now, um, the, instead of a name, because the environment doesn't have a name, we get the path from the root of the file system. So this is the absolute path to the current environment, or the active environment that we just created. OK. so. I always create my, um, my project conda environments in a directory env inside my project directory. So I keep all my files for every research project I have in their own folder. Within that folder, I will have a env subdirectory, which is where I install my conda stuff. And I use this conda create uh, with prefix uh, command. And I would encourage you to do the same. Um, and it's a similar convention to VN, uh, which is another tool, and PIPIN. Um, they create uh, environments in subdirectories. Um, so I try to follow that convention because I think it's a good one. Um, and also, if you use Git to um, version control your, your code, then um, Git ignore, the default Git ignore for Python will ignore a directory called EMV. So you don't want to conversion control your conda environment uh, directory. Uh, we'll talk about version controlling the conda environment file later. Um, but that means that whenever you're working, you always have the same, you're going to change directory into your project directory, and then you just activate the environment there. That's it. You're done. Okay. So let's take a few minutes. Um, so we're going to take our break in about 15 minutes, so, to, so at about 3 o'clock. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, push through to the end of this, um, uh, uh, this episode, and we'll take our break. Um, 
So actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this um, creating a new uh, subdirectory within a project directory um, uh, exercise. I'll leave that for you to complete later. Okay, uh, so we talked about this. So this prompt um, can get pretty long. So for example, like the path itself can be quite long and then we have this uh, user at uh, host. Um, so uh, Dalal, so it's dollar sign capital PWD. So the, the PWD needs to be in capitals, all caps, or you can just use the dot. So it needs to look like this with uh, uppercase PWD for the command to work. Okay. Um, sure. Um, so uh, Fernando is asking me to go over that. Uh, that again. So, did you mean Fernando? Did you mean the uh, the like the capital PWD versus lowercase PWD? Um, uh, okay. So, uh, the law you may not have created the environment in that. Um, so. How to create the folder and activate the environment. I see. Okay. All right. So let's do this exercise then. Let's do this exercise. So let's, um, it's good that you guys are asking questions. So you'll get more out of this if you ask uh, questions about the things that you find uh, confusing. Oh, so Dalal, you've created the environment. You've forgotten the dot when you created the environment. Instead, you created it in the root of your file system. In your command, so you have, I'm going to copy, see if I can copy. I'm not sure I can copy and paste from. No, OK. So. Just hang with me, Dalal. I'll show you what what you did um, and why you're you're getting that error. Um, so let's do this exercise here. So creating a new directory as a subdirectory within a project directory. So let we type the command pwd with lowercase. So this is a Unix command that prints the working directory. Okay. Yeah, that's different than this environment variable pwd that returns um, the same result. So that's important. Then we'll come back to that um, in a minute. Uh, and important to, to Dalal, the problem that you're, you're running into. So now we're going to use another Unix command, make directory, to make a directory called project directory. And I will go back here, OK? So now when I make the project directory over here, I just created this empty project directory. Yep. So now I want to change directories into this project directory that I just created. And now I'm going to create my, uh, my environment. So I'll get that out of the way. And we want to create an environment with Python 3.6, matplotlib 3.1, and uh, TensorFlow. So let's, I'm going to ignore these version numbers and just see what happens um, when I create this environment. So, and we want to create in a particular location. So I'm going to do conda create prefix. Now, here's the important part. Um, if you do this, Um, actually, let me delete. So if you were to do this, then what will happen is 
Conda or the bash will try to uh, replace this with the value of this, which is blank, because this PWD is a command, not a variable. And what you need is the uppercase PWD. And because it replaces this with a blank, it interprets this as, um, as if you typed uh, create this. So it will fill in that, it will fill in this with a blank. And it was as if you typed this, which means that your environment that you created would be in a folder called ENV, but in the very root of your file system. Yeah. So that typo, so what you want is either this or this with uppercase. That's important. So now if we type uh, matplotlib, and uh, what else, Python, I'm gonna do this on multiple lines. And TensorFlow, let's see what happens. So, if we look over here, so inside our project directory, so yes, so we're installing um, uh, TensorFlow 1.14 and what version of Python, uh, Python 3.7. And so we're installing a bunch of stuff. And when this is done, we're going to have a, a directory env. It's going to pop up here and with all the software that we just installed. So one of the nice things about using these, these cloud instances for, um, for something like this is that they're completely um, uh, ephemeral and there's nothing that you can do to break them. So if you break, if, if you kind of break this cloud instance, you just close the browser tab and get a new one. So there's no, no risk that you might inadvertently do something that would you know, cause a problem on your local machine or something like that, that I would have trouble helping you with because I'm not, we're not all together in one room. Um, okay, so Sammy, I see your question in chat and I'll, I'll answer it uh, in just a second. So now to activate the environment that we just created, we can either, we need to pass this command here. And there are many ways within Unix that you can represent this uh, path, which is the absolute path from the root of the file system through the home directory down into the file system to the conda environment directory that we just created. The easiest way is, is to simply do conda activate pwd emv. Or again, you can use the dot, which is another shortcut reference to the current uh, working directory. There we go. Okay. Now, Sammy says, I created an empty environment and then I chose to install all the package with the conda install command in a single command. Does conda still check the correct version of the packages? Um, so it does, but um, the, the path that it does is, is, is different. So you could end up with a different environment, not necessarily a, a, um, a, a wrong environment, but what if you, when you install the, when you install packages as a group, what happens is that Conda will set up um, behind the scenes, Conda sets up something called a satisfiability problem. And it lists out all the packages that you want to install, plus all the dependencies, and creates a system of constraints that have to be satisfied for the environment to be valid. And then it, saw, it finds a, 
the most recent set of packages that solve that system of constraints. Yeah. So if you install all the packages at once, when you create your environment, you're going to get a big system of constraints that need to be solved. If you install them one by one, then each time you run the conda install command, uh, conda is going to create a system of constraints and solve it and install things. And then, so as you, if you install them one after the other individually, you're going to get potentially a different result um, than what you would get if you install them all together, I think. But it's still going to check to make sure that you get a consistent environment. So you're not going to get a quote wrong environment or an environment that's somehow inconsistent. Um, but it might take uh, longer to create an environment in that way than if you just created all the pack, if you just listed all the packages at the beginning. What we'll see after the break is a way to um, provide a single text file that lists out all your packages and then install using, install and create an environment from that text file, which I think is the most efficient way uh, to create an environment. Okay. Um, so, all right, so we talked about this stuff, um, but we're going to skip these uh, exercises in the interest of time. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is list, uh, well, two, the last three, um, uh, ooh, I keep getting distracted by good questions. So Sergio asked, is it possible to assign a name to an environment created with a prefix? So your environment is in a custom directory, but you can activate it with a name. Hmm. I also don't know the answer to this one. So I will have to, I will poke around over our, our break at three o'clock um, and then see if I can come up with an answer to that. That's a new question that I've not been asked before. It's a good one though. Okay, um, so I'm going to deactivate this environment and clear. Okay, um, so I wanna talk about listing environments. Um, so we've created a bunch of environments and now we want to see what environments are available. So I mentioned this earlier, it uh, feels like ages ago, but conda env list will list all the environments that you've created. Notice that we created a couple of environments um, with no names. And so they have a blank for the name, but every environment has a path, which makes sense because um, a path or a prefix, because every environment is itself a, just a directory in your file system. So it, if it's a directory on your file system, then there must be a path to that directory. Okay. Um, if we want to list the contents of an environment, we can do uh, conda list and then the name of the environment. So basic scipy environment. And then this will list all the packages that are installed in that environment. Yeah. And the versions and the build numbers and the channel. We'll talk about channels later. Um, where that uh, package came from. Or if you installed by prefix, then um, you can list by prefix as well. And so if we do this command, this will list the packages installed in the EMV, uh, the environment that we created inside our project directory. And you can see one of the reasons why I like um, using environments in the project directory is that then the commands are all the same. So it's um, you're always using the same prefix to on all your projects. And so you know, okay, I'm in this particular project directory, so these are the commands that I'm using. Uh, and so these are all the things that we installed. So we installed TensorFlow, I think, in that environment. So you can see, yeah, so here are all the TensorFlow uh, packages. Okay. Um, deleting environments. Um, so when uh, deleting environments, I often delete environments um, and because it's easy to recreate them and I don't like the, the clutter. If I know I'm not using an environment anymore, I just delete it. So the way that you do that is with the conda remove command. So um, if we wanted to delete the basic SciPy environment, we would do remove by name or you can remove by prefix if you, if you want. Um, so we can remove by name, uh, basic SciPy environment. And 
the dash dash all um, is important because it removes all the packages as well as the environment itself. So if you, if you left this off, it would expect you to list out packages that you want to remove from an environment. So like if we just wanted to remove a single package from the basic SciPy environment, we could do conda remove dash dash name, basic SciPy environment, uh, maybe SciPy. And so conda is going to go through here and remove SciPy um, and also make sure that it doesn't leave you with any other any packages that depend on SciPy will also remove those. So, so you'll be left with basically a consistent environment. Um, but if we want to remove, if we just want to remove the whole environment, we just don't list individual packages and we just use the dash dash all option. Okay. Um, so right, so we covered a lot. You guys had a lot of good questions, which is great. Um, and um, so, okay, so this is what happens. It will say basically, um, it kind of gives you something similar to what you saw when you installed a package. Um, so here we're removing SciPy and it says, okay, I'm gonna remove SciPy from this environment. Um, and then it's going to remove SciPy as well as scikit-learn because scikit-learn depends on SciPy and then job lib and this other package. And if you're happy with that, you say yes. And now we'll have a, the basic SciPy environment will still be an environment that works. So you're never going to be left with an environment that's somehow broken. Um, but it won't have, you know, the package that you wanted removed and any packages that depend on that package. And if we wanted to remove the whole thing, we just do all. And then you say yes. And it will remove everything. And now if we were to do conda environment list, we'll see that the basic SciPy environment is now gone. So it's no longer anywhere in here. Okay. Uh, and okay, so that was it. So that was one of the big, like just getting you familiar with the mechanics of using uh, Conda is the big uh, goal for the first half. Now the second half, which we'll pick up with at uh, 3, 320, um, we're gonna talk about packages and channels, which is a much shorter uh, episode. And then we're going to talk about sharing environments, which is where we're going to talk about environment files. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and Sergio, I will try to find an answer to uh, to that, to adding a name um, to an environment created with prefix. Um, and, and get back to you after the break. Okay, so I'm going to pause the recording. And unless anybody has any pressing questions that they want me to answer before we go to break. Anyone? No? Okay. So we're going to go to break and I'll see you at 3.20 in 15 minutes. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. So welcome back from the break. Um, the, the, for the rest of this afternoon, we're going to cover two more uh, episodes in our introduction to Conda on using packages and channels and then on environment files. Um, so just real quick, so before the break, there was a great question about, is it possible to assign a name to an environment created with a prefix so that environment is in a custom directory, but you can activate it with a name? So I think the answer is, uh, is, uh, Yes, um, and I'm going to put a link um, into a chat to a Stack Overflow post that provides some links to the Conda documentation and, um, and some other things. So I looked at this answer, and it's a little bit too involved and involves messing around with your Conda configuration file for me to try to do live. Um, um, 
I have made a little note uh, to myself. Um, and in fact, um, that I will show you. So I will share my screen. So this is the link that I just sent you. So um, what I will do is um, I will make a little note. Um, so on the introduction to Conda for data scientists, so this is the GitHub repo that stores the teaching notes. So I will just open an issue for myself and um, provide an example of how to create and by prefix but with a name. So show name so that it can be integrated as near as possible. Okay, so there I put a little issue for myself to come back to and look at that later. Um, okay, cool. So let's see where we were. Okay, so using packages and channels. So this is a much shorter episode. And then we have the, the longer episode um, four is the one that will end the day on. So in this uh, episode, we're gonna talk about what are conda channels and then what are conda packages. So we've been kind of using the term conda package, but we haven't really talked too much about, um, uh, about what they are. And talk about why you should be explicit about the channels that you use on your research project, and then what to do if a Python package isn't available via a conda channel. And we'll see how to install packages from a specific channel. Okay, so what are conda packages first? So a conda package is basically a compressed archive file. So you may have encountered uh, files that end in an extension, you know, dot tar dot bz2. So files like this are tar archives that are created using the tar tool, which basically takes a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of um, files and creates a single file with all of those files and directories inside of it using a tool called tar. And then BZ2 is a compression algorithm that gets applied to the archive to create a kind of compressed version of that archive. So, so it's, it's basically an efficient way to store a whole bunch of files together so that they can be downloaded quickly over a network. Okay, so in this compressed archive file, so in, the, in this conda package, you have uh, system level libraries, Python and possibly other modules, there are executable programs and other components, metadata, um, and then a collection of files that should be installed. So this is all just information that Conda keeps track of, uses to keep track of the dependencies between the packages and platforms. And, um, and this is a, a consistent format across all operating systems. So the, a package structure looks like this. So inside of this archive, there will be a bin directory, which will have any binary, uh, pre-compiled binaries that are required for the package. Then there's a bunch of like metadata info, and then uh, a lib directory, which has all of the uh, actual packages that are to be installed. Yeah. So that's, you know, this is an example for a, a library called PyTorch, which is a, uh, a Python deep learning library. Um, and that's it. So basically, I, when I mean a con, I just want all you really, I guess, need to know is that a conda package is a, um, a compressed archive file that has a very particular structure. They always have this bin, info, and lib structure. And it's kind of consistent across operating systems. 
And I don't think you need to know any more details than that, unless you want to build your own Conda packages. Um, and I'm working on an episode on how to build Conda packages. Um, and that will be a more advanced training that we might put on the uh, on our YouTube channel later. So look out for that. Okay, so what about channels? So um, channels are basically just uh, URLs where these packages um, live. And so when you add channels to Conda or you install from a particular channel, you're basically telling Conda to look at a particular URL and find this compressed archive file with a particular name. So that's what's going on. Um, there are a few uh, default channels. So there's a main channel, which is where uh, Anaconda, which is a company that um, has develops a lot of open source software in the scientific uh, Python community. Um, it maintains this main channel. Um, and that's usually the default kind of top priority channel. There's also an R channel, um, which uh, includes uh, Microsoft's R uh, Conda packages and Anaconda's R packages. So, and you know, if you're an R user, then you can uh, you can use Conda to manage your R R packages as well. Um, a channel that we've been using a lot without even talking about it is the Conda Forge channel. So, uh, Conda Forge is um, a community uh, channel that uh, distributes software for the Conda tool. And um, it is the largest collection of um, kind of Python or Conda packages available for, uh, for install and is usually the channel that I get most of my software from. In fact, where we've been getting most of our, our software from. If we looked at, um, uh, where was our Conda list? Uh, so if we just listed uh, the contents of a particular environment, you can see Conda Forge is listed as the channel for nearly all of these, um, or in fact, all of them. So we've been using Conda Forge as the, the channel without um, even talking about it. Um, so Conda Forge tends to have more bleeding edge or more very, very recent releases. So things tend to come out in Conda Forge and then some make their way into the default uh, channel, um, but there are other, and there are other things that are available, like different implementations of linear algebra libraries and things like that than the defaults. Okay, so how do we install from a particular channel? So uh, there are a couple of ways to do this. So let me clear this out. So if we were to activate the machine learning environment, and then if we did conda, and if we just do conda list without any name or prefix, it will list the contents of a currently active environment. And so we can look in here and um, uh, it looks like SciPy is already installed. So let's try to pick, um, uh, pick another one. What else could we install that? Let's see if Dask, yeah, Dask is in here. Hmm. What about, can we install Numba? What version of Python do we have? 3.9, so that's not gonna work. Um, let's install PyTorch. We'll install PyTorch. Um, so PyTorch is actually an example of a library that lives on its own channel. So instead of using Conda Forge, since we've been using Conda Forge all along, um, I'll use a different channel than what's in the notes here. So let's suppose that we wanted to install PyTorch. So we could do Conda install um, and, and we can add the channel PyTorch and then um, make this a little bit bigger. PyTorch. Yeah. So this is going to install uh, the PyTorch library, and it's going to look in the PyTorch channel to install that library. So we'll see what it comes up when. Uh... Oh, 
when it's done. So at first, anytime of course you install something, no matter what channel you're installing from, it kind of needs to check that it's possible to install this library. And um, so let's see what's going to get installed. So we're going to install the MKL build of the BLAST basic linear algebra system toolkit. Um, and uh, MKL, so these are the Intel's math kernel libraries. So these are required by PyTorch to accelerate CPU computations on Intel CPUs and including OpenMP, which is also installed for the same reason. So these are coming from the defaults channels. So this is kind of like the main channel, basically. Then we're going to pick up some other libraries from Conda Forge, um, including actually CUDA. So this is going to install a GPU version of PyTorch, um, even though um, we haven't talked about that yet. But we're going to install the CUDA toolkit version 11 from Conda Forge. And then PyTorch. And note that this PyTorch build is compatible with Python 3.9 and CUDA 11 um, and uh, CUDNN 8, and, but it's from the PyTorch channel. And then, so we're going to install some new packages and actually downgrade um, some other packages, which is fine. So we'll just say yes. So this is just an example of installing a, a, a of the syntax of installing a package from a particular channel. That's all. Okay. There's a question on the chat. Ah, so good question. How can I know the channel that a package should be installed from? So, um, in general, you want to install things from Conda Forge uh, and defaults. And then if your software is installable via Conda but needs to be installed from a particular channel, usually the software installation instructions will mention that. So for example, if you were to look at the PyTorch um, web page and go to I'm getting started. Yeah. So if you were to go and see so look at Linux. And um, yeah, so here, this is actually, so Conda is the preferred method to install. And if you look at the, uh, the Conda install command, it kind of tells you that you need to specify the PyTorch channel, which is this part here. Dash C is shorthand for dash dash channel. Or um, if you wanted to another one, um would be so if you're interested in um, bioinformatics um then there's the bioconda channel which has a lot of um, bioinformatics and genomics tools that you install using the uh, from the bioconda channel and so if you were to look up those tools then they would all list uh like the BioConda channel as the channel that you should install from. Um, right, let's go back and check on how we're doing. Still installing. Hmm. This might end up taking longer than I had hoped because it is a big um, uh, package, so 1.82 gigs. Um, we'll let that go for a minute. So. So here are some other examples. Um, so if you wanted to install a, a particular package uh, from a particular channel into a particular environment without first activating that environment, then you could use the name or the prefix to indicate which environment you want to install which package from which channel uh, into. Yep. So that's another way that you can do it. Um, here's another example of the same again, except you're using prefix instead of name to install a particular version of TensorFlow from a particular channel. Um, and an R example. Okay, so channel priority. So um, you can specify multiple channels for installing packages by passing the channel argument multiple times. And then the channel priority uh, decreases from 
left to right. So SciPy, for example, with this command, conda install SciPy, and then you list a couple of channels, it would first look, Conda would first look in the Conda Forge channel for SciPy and it would find it. And therefore it would install SciPy from Conda Forge. Um, if you listed a package that wasn't available on Conda Forge, but was available on BioConda, then Conda would first check Conda Forge for that package. And if it didn't find it, it would then go and check the BioConda channel for that package. And then it would install it from the BioConda channel. Um, so this kind of channel priority is important. Uh, I'm not going to stress it too much because even though it is important, because in the next section, when we talk about um, environment files, I'm going to show you very specifically how to list the channels that you want to use um, and the order in which you want to list them. And then that's the way that I do it. Um, and, uh, and that's the way that I recommend that, that you do as well. Okay. So this is still going, installing uh, the CUDA toolkit. So I guess I'll let that run a little bit longer. Actually, I'm not going to let this run any longer. It's taking too long. I'm just going to hit Control C and um, kill this this off. And um, there we go. And so basically, I'm just no longer downloading or installing any of these things. Um, OK. So I'm just going to clear that out. But it would have gone through and completed. Um, I just didn't want to don't want to let it run too any longer. OK. So what about if your, your package isn't available uh, on the defaults channel? What should you do? So. The first thing that you should do is check to see if that, um, that package is available on, on Conda Forge, for example. Um, so if we were uh, to do, to search for, so there's a, a command line API uh, for uh, Kaggle, um, which you can download and use to um, extract data and competitions and participate in competitions uh, if you use Kaggle. So Kaggle is a great way to get started learning how to do machine learning uh, and data science by participating in these competitions, um, these Kaggle competitions. So would highly recommend that as a great learning source. And there's a, an API for interacting with Kaggle um, in an automated fashion that you can install. Um, and it's available on, on Conda Forge. So for example, if we did Conda search uh, channel Conda Forge and Kaggle. Then we'll see that this is available on this. This is a package that's not available on the defaults channel, but it is available on Conda Forge. So you should always check to see if a package you want to install is available on Conda Forge before you do anything else. Then if your package is not on Conda Forge, then it could be on other more domain specific channels like BioConda, um, or obviously PyTorch has its own channel. Um, but a lot of these packages that have their own custom channels, you will have figured that out by visiting the website and reading the installation instructions. And they'll tell you, oh, you should install via Conda from this particular channel, I'll tell you what it is. Okay. Um, if you cannot find the package, the, the Python package that you want to install on Conda Forge, or it's not, um, the instructions do not say to install from some channel, custom channel like PyTorch or, um, or something like that, then you can use pip. Yep. And so pip is kind of a, a last resort. So Conda wherever possible, even from some other Conda channel, pip only when necessary. So pip is your, your kind of last resort to do this. Um, and so Kaggle is actually available on, um, on Conda Forge. So we could install it. Um, uh, we could install it from, uh, from Conda Forge. So we could do uh, Conda uh, install Kaggle channel Conda Forge. And 
this should uh, install Kaggle from the Contiports channel. And we'll just say yes, boom, done. Okay, there we go. Um, and here in this example that I just did, I installed Kaggle into the active environment, which was the machine learning environment. So if we go through here and we use the conda list command to list the da -da. so here it is, here's Kaggle. In the lecture notes, it, it installs Kaggle into um, the uh, a, a pre, uh, environment created uh, at that prefix. Uh, we'll see some more. I'm going to talk in a minute about how to do how to install things with pip, but pip is the kind of last resort. Okay, so what actually happens when you install a package? So here's kind of uh, from the official docs, uh, Conda documentation. So here's a kind of um, a decision tree, if you want to think of it that way, uh, on what happens when you type the Conda install command. So Conda goes through and pulls in the repo data uh, for each configured channel. So um, it will always look in the defaults channels. And if you add extra channel arguments when you're installing, um, then it will check and pull all the repo data from all of those channels that you specified. And then it will try to match the package that you want against the repo data. And if it doesn't find a match, then it throws an error, nothing is installed. Um, if it does find the package that you want in the channels that you have asked it to search, then it goes and creates a list of all the dependencies for the package or packages that you want. And then it might need to get dependencies of those dependencies. So it basically keeps looking for dependencies and keeps searching in the repo in these channels for all the dependencies until there are no more dependencies to, to, to find. And if it once it finds all of those and it doesn't have any problems finding them on the channels that you've specified, then it downloads and installs the packages. If it can't find dependencies that it needs at any time, then it um, then it will kind of ins uh, don't it won't install and will return an error message. So that's kind of the the decision tree for how that that process works. Okay. Um, so there is a, there are a couple of, uh, of exercises here. So let's take, um, so Let's take a few minutes and do this alternative syntax for installing packages from channels exercise. So I'll set a timer for three minutes, um, and then we will uh, we'll go through that exercise together. And in the meantime, I will stop sharing my screen. And I'm just going to go through and do this exercise as well. Um, and then if someone has questions, you can ask them in chat and I will keep my eye out for those.
And if you're going through the exercise and once in, once you've got the, the conda command from the environment to solve properly and it started to, to download stuff, you can just um, hit control C or control Z to cancel the process um, or maybe not even start the download process um, because the downloads with PyTorch again will take, take some time. So let me share my screen again. And I will show you my, my answer. OK, so um, here, so we want to uh, make a directory called my final project um, inside the uh, introduction to conda directory. And then I try to run this conda create command um, to create an environment at a particular prefix and using this alternative syntax for installing from a particular channel. And I got this warning because I wasn't in the right directory and there was already an environment there. So basically by default, Conda is going to warn you if an environment already exists at the prefix on which you're trying to uh, create an environment and will ask you whether you want to remove that environment first. And I, so I said no, because I was in the wrong directory. So then I changed to the right directory, the final project directory. So you can see here I am in the final project directory. And then I ran the command again. So I'm just using this alternative syntax using the, the, the channel and then two colons followed by the name of the package. And then here's the channel followed by two colons and the name of the package. And then these other packages I just wanted to get from Conda Forge. So I didn't need to put anything special there. And then um, uh, Conda saw for the environment and then basically gave me this plan for what it would do. And now I'm just going to say um, no, um, because I don't want to take all the time to download all, all that software, um, given our time constraint. OK, so let's clear that. OK, so unless there are any questions about that, I'm going to move on to talking about how to um, handle uh, PIP and using PIP within Conda environments, which is an important topic. OK, so I don't see any questions in chat. OK, so what to do if a Python package isn't available on any Conda channel? So if you cannot find um, your pack, Python package available on any kind of channel, you can, of course, use pip, okay? So, but there are a few potential issues with pip that um, you need to be aware of to make sure that you combine conda and pip effectively. So uh, the first is that sometimes pip is already installed on your computer. And it may be installed on your computer. Sometimes it's called pip3. Um, but it may be installed on your computer because your computer has its own version of Python and it needs to manage Python dependencies that are used to, for the operating system. This is particularly common on Linux systems. Um, and so in that case, you want to make sure that you're not using the system version of PIP to install Python packages because that could end up installing them outside of your content environment, which is not what you want. Okay. Second, um, the Minicon installer is going to have its own version of PIP. And you don't want to use that version of PIP either, because that might end up installing um, libraries not in your Conda environment, but maybe in your base uh, Conda environment, which is not what you want. What you want to do is um, is make sure that pip is installed inside of your um, inside of all your Python based conda environments and then always use the pip inside your conda environment to install packages into that conda environment. I'll show you how to do that. So this is just a very wordy way to to explain that. So um, let's look at um, Um, let's activate the 
machine learning environment. And then let's do a condo list to see, to see if PIP is installed. PIP is installed. Okay, so there's PIP. So PIP is installed inside that environment. So if PIP has not been installed, then you definitely you need to install it in your in your condo environment. And then you want to make sure um, that your condo environment is active. So for example, if we deactivated, so here, if we type the command which PIP, see how we get the path to the PIP binary is the PIP binary inside our environment, our machine learning environment. If we were not inside the machine learning environment and we said, well, which PIP, we get a completely different PIP. So if we were to do PIP install now, PIP would install packages into the notebook environment, which is not what we want. And if we even were to deactivate the notebook environment, there's even another version of PIP, which is, well, no, this is the same version of, uh, of PIP. Um, but even outside of the notebook environment, there will be a system version of PIP. Um, so we want to make sure, activate, that the environment in which you want to install packages using PIP is the active environment. So we can do which pip. And so we can check this is in fact the active environment. And then we, when we go to install a package, we use um, this syntax here. So python n pip install. So this is another guard to make sure that pip installs into the correct, uh, into the correct location. So I'll just go ahead and do this, um, this exercise here together. So there's a package called combo, which is a neat little package um, for doing what's called ensemble learning. Um, and that ensemble learning package uh, is only available on PyPI, which is the Python package index. And it can only be installed using pip. So we're going to install that now using pip. Um, where am I? Hi, I'm teaching right now. Guess what? You're going to end up on YouTube. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, off you go. Oh dear. Okay, so um where was i sorry for that train of thought is completely broken now oh installing combo with pip okay okay so what we're going to do is we're going to do now that um the machine learning environment is active we're going to do python dash m pip install combo And so this is going to go through and install um, a bunch of packages that Combo needs that aren't currently installed in the environment, um, including Numba um, and all the dependencies that Numba needs, also stats models, um, package called Patsy. And this might throw an error because of the issue with Numba. Um, and in fact, that is what happened. Okay, um, let me see what is going on here. So, LL, like, hmm. So, let's, which Python? So, this is on the fly debugging. So, let's see what is going on here. So, I think the issue is this Python 3.9. So let's do, 
Um, let's do the following. This Python 3.9 business has been, has caught me several times today. So let's do this. Let's do uh, conda remove uh, machine learning environment all. Oh, conda remove name. Yes. Okay. Um, I see there are some questions in chat, but I'm going to um, I'm going to create uh, the machine learning environment again and I'm going to install Python, but this time I'm going to do Python 3.8, um, scikit-learn, mat, uh, plotlib, just do that. So it seems like this is working for um, some people, but not others. I think it has to do with the version of Python that is uh, that is installed. So I'm creating a version of the machine learning library, a machine learning environment that has Python 3.8. Um, and And then I'm going to install Numba and see if Numba installs correctly. Great. So then let's do conda install Numba into the machine learning environment. Excellent. So this should avoid the error that I was getting earlier, this um, way up here. So this is an error that is coming from Pip having to tr try to install uh, LLVM Lite and getting an error. Um, and not quite sure why this error was generated, but I think it has to do with the fact that the version of Python was 3.9 and um, Numba and LLVM Lite do not work with Python 3.9. So I, my, I went back and I removed um, the Conda environment and I basically recreated um, the conda environments here with python 3.8 and then after that was done i went to install numba yeah and so now that is done and so now if i do um conda uh, activate machine learning environment and I do uh, conda, conda list. Now, for those of you who, who on chat were um, saying that, well, I installed PIP uh, while machine learning environment is active, but you're still getting um, the wrong PIP when you install um, so if you, you should see pip listed here. And when you do uh, conda list, 
and the machine learning environment is active, you should see PIT already listed in here. So there shouldn't have been any need to install PIP um, And, but once that says, once you know that pip is in the environment, you should be able to do python dash m pip install combo. And now note that all of most of these requirements in here are already satisfied. So number was already in there, LLVM light was already in there. Um, and so it just needed to install pandas, stats models, and some of these other things. Um, and we could have installed these other things from Conda um, as well uh, without, and then there would be basically nothing to install via pip except for combo. And now it seemed to have worked. Yes, so Arish, if you do this exercise again, it's recommended to install Python 3.8. Yes, so I will, so this is, this, so this is actually a bug that we have uncovered in the lecture notes. So Python 3.9 was only very recently uh, released. And so Numba and some of these, uh, some packages, well, I guess Numba in particular and some dependencies of Numba do not yet support Python 3.9. And so what's happening is that um, I need to, update my lecture notes to make sure that I only install um, at most Python 3.8 when doing these machine learning exercises, or more likely by the time I teach this course again, um, uh, number will support Python 3.9 and then um, and then I won't run into that, uh, that problem. But it's basically, you have uncovered a bug in my, uh, my teaching notes, um, which I should, um, I make a note of to change for next time. Okay, so kind of on the fly, we did quite a lot. So um, you can, when this is recording is released on YouTube, you can kind of you know rewind and kind of go through these different steps to to see how I how I was able to fix this um, and get it to work. But it involves um, something that is not uncommon when using Conda and pip is that you try to pip install some stuff and it doesn't work. And then the way to get it to work is to go back and use Conda to install some of the dependencies that PIP was trying to install. So in this case, again, what failed was um, when we tried to do PIP was Numba and LLVM Lite didn't install. So then what I did was I went back and changed the environment so that I could install uh, Numba. Um, and then actually I could have installed all these other packages as well from Conda, except for this one. Um, and then gone, then once I changed the Conda environment to include those packages, I was able to successfully install Combo with PIP. Okay. Um, right. So we have just under an hour left. And so it's a good time to move on to the final uh, episode. So are there any questions about, um, about this episode before I move on? Uh, so Muna asked, what is the YouTube channel? So I'll put the, um, I'll put the link to the YouTube channel in chat. Um, but you'll get a link to the, the YouTube channel. Um, um, probably tomorrow, which will include an uploaded version of um, of today's workshop. Okay. All right, so let's share screen again. Share.
Okay. Um, sharing environments. So um, in this last episode, we're going to talk about how to share your content environment with others. Um, and we're talking about why you might want to do that. And then we're going to talk, see how to create um, content environments uh, or content environment files and then create content environments from those files. And this is going to be the workflow that I use in all my projects. And so I like to end with, with that one. Um, so here we go. So working with environment files. Um, so when you're working on some kind of a collaborative research project, um, you know, you might have a different operating system from uh, your colleagues. Like maybe you have a Mac and they have Windows or someone has Linux. Um, and so you might want to have a way to share your environment um, across all those platforms efficiently. Um, and it would be great if we could just have a, a single kind of text file that you could share that text file with all of your colleagues. And then from that text file, they could use Conda to create a environment um, on their laptop or workstation that was uh, similar to your environment. So we're gonna talk about how to, how to do that here. Um, so creating an environment file. So environment files are written in a kind of a markup language. Um, called YAML. Uh, it's a human readable uh, language. Uh, it's very common to use YAML for configuration files, um, uh, particularly for Python projects, as it has very kind of Python style indentation to indicate nesting and all these kinds of things. So let's create um, an environment file. So environment files kind of um, look as follows. So you have um, a text file that has a name. Uh, so this is the name is the key. The value is machine learning environment. And then this is like how you would represent a list of, of things in YAML. So you have a key called dependencies and then kind of items in a list. And the dependencies are the packages that you want to install. OK, so we can actually just uh, copy. And then over here, we can, um, let's do PMD. OK, so I'm just going to make a new directory uh, called another project. And I should deactivate my machine learning environment. Wait. Machine learning environment. And um, actually, I'll go ahead and delete it. And then I'll recreate it from the environment file. Um, so I will, uh, where was I? Another project. Right. So inside um, this another project that I just created, I will create um, a new text file. And then I'll just paste the contents in there. And then I will just rename this and I will call this my environment.yml for environment.yml. There we go. Um, and then file uh, save. Or you could also do command or control s. Okay. So we've created this file. The important thing is that the file is just in a particular directory. I put it in another another project. Um, and now what we'll do is we will, um, you know, we could add version numbers here. So I'm not going to do that, but we could go through here and put version numbers just like we did. Um, I guess the important thing is that I'll just add um, Python and I will say Python should be 3.8. Um, but these others can be whatever we wish them to be. Um, and I'll just go ahead and add a uh, number in here as well. Uh, oh, I've got Python in here twice. Uh, so Python uh, 3.8. And then I'll go ahead and add number. Uh, if you're wondering about the order, so the ordering doesn't really matter. 
I'm a bit pedantic, so I tend to put things in alphabetical order, um, but the ordering is not in any way um, uh, impact the installation process. So I'll save this and then, um, so I need to CD into my another project. And then if I do LS, I can see this environment file here. Um, and the environment files are the things that you want to version control. Um, with, uh, so you don't want to version control your Conda environment because there's so much stuff in there. It, would take up a lot of space, but you can just version control your environment.yaml file, and then you can, um, uh, and then you can always recreate your environment uh, from that, or you can share that. Um, okay, and so now I'm going to use this command to create, um, and I'm not going to paste it up. So it's conda env create. And prefix. So I'm going to create it using a prefix. But note again, it's a slightly different. It's not conda create. It's conda env create. Yep. And then I'm going to do a multi-line command. Um, and then this is going to be from a file environment.yml yaml and hit enter. And so now all the steps that Conda went through to create the environment um, when we use the Conda create command are exactly the same. Um, except now Conda's not gonna ask for a prompt or not gonna prompt us to confirm that this is what we wanna do. It's just gonna do it. <coughs> Excuse me. So now Conda has gone and downloaded the repo data from all of the different channels, which is basically just the Conda Forge channel and the defaults channel. So it has all of that repo data. And now it's going through those, those channels, the repo data from those channels, and is figuring out whether it can find uh, all the packages that it needs, um, figuring out which ones it needs to download and extract, ones that aren't already cached, and then um, is checking, uh, checking that these um, archives are legitimate, that they're not corrupted in some way. Um, and then it's going to start actually um, building the environment. So now we're done. And now we have created um, a, the environment inside this EMV directory. And if we did conda env list, so you can see this is the direct the environment that we just created. Okay. Um, okay. So, but what happens if you have a, you've created environments like we created? Um, uh, oh, I deleted the. Shouldn't have deleted the machine learning environment. So conda create name basic sci-fi environment. Uh, Python create uh, numpy sci-fi. Just do that. So suppose that you had created an environment um, at the command line like this, not from an environment file. Is there a way that we could get back um, an environment file for that? Um, so let's clear this out. So the answer is yes. So there's this command, uh, conda env export. And so let's take a look at that. So conda env export command, and then we do the name. Uh, basic SciPy environment. And then you'll see what happens is that now 
here, we've basically been given an environment file. So you could copy and paste this into a, a file and this would be an environment file, but it's very specific. In particular, it's only, it's, it's giving um, versions and build numbers that are for Linux because that's the system on which this was, um, this was created. And note that it's not just providing things like SciPy and Python and NumPy that we specifically asked for um, in this command when we created it. It's giving us all the dependencies and the dependencies of dependencies and so on and so forth, all of those things. Um, so this is quite a lot more information than we maybe need and that we want because if someone who, if we gave, if we put copied and pasted this into a text file and gave it to somebody who runs Windows or Mac, then they wouldn't be able to create, our, uh, create the environment from this because it has Linux specific packages in there. So um, one thing that we can do is instead of using the conda environment Yeah, um, we can add another option, which is from history. And this creates kind of the, only includes the dependencies, only includes those dependencies that we actually manually installed at the command line. Yeah, so it only includes SciPy, Python, and NumPy. So this, you could copy and paste into a file, share that with anyone who uses Windows, Linux, Mac, doesn't matter. And Conda would be able to build this environment for them. So this is the one, like, so this is the command that you wanna use if you need to create an environment file from an existing environment and make it be um, uh, operating system agnostic. So it can work across any operating system. This is a command that I will often ask users of our IBEX cluster to run when they're having trouble getting their environments running on IBEX. And the reason is that we're, you know, as a staff member who's supporting them on IBEX, we're all using the same Linux operating system that runs on IBEX. So this is a good, this is great for me because then I know exactly what they've installed on IBEX on, on the Linux uh, version that's running on IBEX, and then I can create the exact same environment, no problem. But that's because we're sharing basically a common operating system. In general, this is the command that I would use to create an environment file that I wanted to share with others. Um, so let's take uh, five minutes and have you work through this exercise. So I want you to create an environment file and I'm giving you basically the environment file here. Um, you can leave off the version numbers if you wish. Uh, and then basically create a new directory, uh, create a text file in that directory, call it environment.yaml, put this contents in there and then create the environment um, from that file. And I will set my uh, timer and stop sharing. Uh, so uh, Dahlia asked, does from history include pip install packages? It should. Um, let me uh, let me do a test and then I will let you know. Uh, just one moment. Okay, back. So I will check about this from history and see if it includes pip installed packages. So
So Farouk from history generates the packages. Okay, so Farouk, I'll be right with your question. I'm still checking on the, the, uh, the pip. Hmm. So it seems like um, it seems like it's not picking up the pip installed packages that I've just installed, but I feel like it should. And so I'm wondering if I've done something quickly wrong. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. So what I did um, was while you guys were working on that exercise. So what I did was um, I installed combo uh, using pip into the basic sci-fi environment. So if you do a, a Conda list, now you can see that there's all these packages that say PyPI, so that's Python package index. So these are all the things that were installed via pip. Yep. Okay. Now, um, if I were to do uh, Conda EMV export, So you can see that the environment file that again is Linux specific outputs um, all of this, including note that it puts in here pip and then it lists all the stuff that is installed via pip. Um, but then if you do conda uh, emv export from history, it only puts out the things that were, it only has the history of the conda um, install, installed ones. So let's look at the help menu for export and see if we can find something. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you can do is you can add, um, so there is a no builds option. And the no builds option takes away the build numbers, but it still is probably going to include some things like these guys, which are probably Linux specific packages. 
um, and aren't available for Windows or Mac. Um, so I don't think that's going to get us there. I will make a note about this. Um, and this is a particularly important one. So what I'm going to do is go to my um, issues, new issue, um, exporting and environment using from history is not showing it installed packages. Make a little note to myself. So Note to self for later um, to, to take a look at that. Uh, I'll just leave this up in case I end up running into uh, more issues. So now the way I avoid this is by always creating uh, my environments from environment files uh, and then including all of my pip install stuff in the environment file, much like you see here. And then I always know, I always have an environment file. So I just, I just don't create environments except from environment files to begin with. And so I never encounter this problem in practice. Um, although I will, I will try to figure out um, a workaround uh, for that. Let me see what's up in chat. So, so uh, Sammy's question, well, if you install stuff via Conda later, are you going to have a different problem? So no. So Conda, every time you run a Conda install command, it creates like a little snapshot. Um, this is kind of a, a deeper dive than I wanted to go today. Um, but it will create basically this history of, of commands that you have run to build up that environment. And so it will always be able to keep track of anything that you've done in the past via a Conda command. It's just the the pip stuff. And this is one of the difficulties about getting, you know, two different tools that don't really have any knowledge of one another to work together. Um, but in some sense, I feel like there should be a way to, to do it because when you export the environment, it's able to see that uh, pip install these things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I don't know. So maybe um, I'll, I'll dig a little deeper and see. Thank you, Fernando. OK. Um, so specifying channels in the environment um, file. So um, as you may have seen in the exported environment files that we've looked at, there's this channel section. And this is where you specify your channels. And the priority is highest priority channels are listed at the top, lowest priority at the bottom. So all of my environment files have a channel section, and it all looks like this, conda forged and defaults. And then if I happen to have um, any other channels, they would have higher priority over conda forged, like PyTorch or um, something like this. OK. Um, so updating an environment. So you can update an environment um, using a very similar command to uh, you can make changes to your environment.yaml file, and then you can run this command here, conda environment update, and it will uh, it will update the environment based on the, the new contents of the environment.yaml file. And if you pass this dash dash prune option, it will remove any packages that are no longer used. So if you like, instead of adding a dependency, if you delete the dependency, and the dash dash prune option will remove that dependency from the environment as well as any other packages that aren't being used. Um, what I tend to do is actually just rebuild from scratch. So if I make changes to my environment.yaml file, um, I just add, I run this command with the dash dash force option. 
And I just run this command over and over. So if I add stuff or remove stuff from the environment.yaml file, I just recreate the entire environment from scratch by using this force option to forcibly remove and then recreate the environment. Basically just means I only need to remember the same command to both create and update my environments. And the cost is that you're recreating from scratch every time, so it's a little bit slower. But what I find in practice is that I don't actually create my con environments like that often. Um, and um, you know, maybe that just comes from practice that I know I, I'm more experienced and therefore I know kind of what, what uh, packages I'm going to want. But I don't really find myself creating environments that often. Um, and so this is not a, recreating from scratch every time using this command is not a big cost, in my opinion. OK. Um, ah, OK. Installing via pip an environment file. So this is important. So um, you can list pip uh, dependencies inside your environment file. So what you can do is you can have you know, your conda install dependencies, like here. And then you can have a little pip subsection where you have pip. And then you list stuff that you want to install via pip. Yeah. And so that's, that's what this is going on here. Yeah. So uh, the thing to note is that when you're using um, version numbers, that Conda ha uses single version numbers, pip uses uh, single equal sign, sorry, and pip uses double equal sign. So that's just like a pip syntax thing that's different than Conda syntax and, and whatnot. Um, Another handy little trick, which I like to use, is, um, is to create a separate requirements.txt file and put all my pip installed stuff there. And then in my pip section, instead of listing out all this stuff, the pip section of my environment files looks the same everywhere. It just looks like this. And then what happens is that um, pip will install everything that's listed in this requirements.txt file. So for an example of that, on my um, calst, um, um, oh, what am I talking about? I already have it open over here. So on the... Um, the Kaos BizLab GitHub repo, uh, I have a bunch of template projects for different, um, uh, to help people get started with different um, uh, data science machine learning packages. So for example, if you were to look at the scikit-learn data science project, then I have files in here, like an environment.yaml file. And this has a whole bunch of stuff um, for doing uh, scikit-learn that you would commonly want to use inside of a scikit-learn data science uh, project. And note the pip section. So some of the dependencies are only available via pip. So I put those in the separate requirement.txt file. And then inside this requirement.txt file, I have a list of the things to install via pip. Again, using pip syntax and things like that. that um, and then it's the, I just use this command, the same command, and it runs and installs everything, including the pip dependency. So basically, it helps me keep separate stuff that's installed via conda and stuff that's installed via pip um, at the cost of having these two separate files. Um, but it also allows you, if you become more, um, for advanced use cases, um, it's like a very complicated use case is this Horovod uh, environment for doing distributed deep learning training. Um, if you look inside the requirements.txt, so in here I have to do special pip things um, that are outside the scope of, of today's training um, by using special syntax in, that only works inside of pip requirements.txt files. Um, this one ensures that Horovod is is recompiled whenever the environment is rebuilt. And um, I can only do 
that when I build the content environment by putting these things in its separate requirements.txt file. There's no way for me to, sorry, there's no way for me to like list these things inside a pip subsection of an environment.yaml file and also do this, which is important for this particular advanced, uh, advanced use case. So I would encourage you um, to take a look at these different uh, projects. Um, if you're getting started as kind of templates for, uh, for getting started, I've also got one for Jax um, and a more basic Python GPU. There's also a plain Python one um, as examples to help you get started uh, with your own maybe more advanced uh, use cases. Okay, that was a bit of a, a bit of an aside. Okay. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. And so I'm going to cover one more thing, which is how to create um, um, uh, make Jupyter Lab aware of your Conda environments. So um, so in order to do that, so basically, what does it mean to make JupyterLab aware of your, uh, of your Conda environments? So here, um, so we've created all these Conda environments. These notebook, if I was to launch a notebook, um, these notebooks or these Python consoles are not linked to any of the environments that we've created. So if I wanted to be able to create um, a notebook based on one of the Conda environments that I created, for example, maybe the, um, um, the machine learning environment or something like that, then um, I would need to make, uh, make it Jupyter aware of that environment. And so the way that you do that is by installing this IPy kernel package. So since I've got the basic SciPy environment up, um, We'll, we'll use this one as the as the example. So if I do a conda list, so I'm checking to see if IPy kernel has been installed, and it has not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do conda install IPy kernel, and it's going to install that, and of course into the active environment, basic SciPy environment. And it needs to install a bunch of dependencies like IPython and Jupyter stuff. So I just say yes. Okay. And so now that I've installed that, then I can run and I check. So I make sure it's active. So I'm going to do a conda list again just to make sure that it installed as expected. Yeah, so here's IPy kernel. Okay, so now I run this command here, except I'm going to make a, so I'm going to use Python dash M to run IPy kernel install user. This is a bit cryptic, I know, but it, it's kind of like the magic command that one needs to run. Um, if you want to create, if you want to make Jupyter Lab aware of your um, your you can give it whatever name you want. Um, so I'll just call it my basic SciPy kernel. And then the display name is what is actually going to show up here. So it's what this Python 3 is going to be change to. So display name. Um, and I'll call this uh, basic sci-fi. Something like this. I don't know. Sci -fi. Enter. Done. So what this has done is it basically created a special file in a very particular place and this is the place where Jupyter Lab will look to figure out what uh, 
what environments need to have uh, notebooks created, notebooks and consoles created against them. So then if you go back to your launcher, then now we have this basic SciPy environment. And if we were to click this, now we have um, Jupyter Notebooks, but that have all the packages that are installed inside the basic SciPy environment. So if we were to import um, from SciPy, import optimize, if we want to import the optimized toolkit from SciPy, now we can do that. Okay. Um, if you want more details on how to um, how to get, you know, we haven't talked too much about Jupyter Lab that we're going to cover a lot of that next week in the introduction to Python. Um, just going to discard that. Um, in the introduction to Python lecture uh, or workshop. Um, um, so don't worry too much about that. Um, okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, right, so where to go to learn more. So I have given this particular training at, um, at a few major conferences um, at uh, SciPy 2020, um, PyCon Africa, SciPy Japan, um, and then a talk on how to make Conda and PIP and Jupyter Lab work well together at JupyterCon 2020. Um, and I'll provide links to the, those tutorials and talks. Um, um, I'll put them in the section below the YouTube um, uh, video uh, in case you want, you know, other uh, tutorials where I go through similar content to this. Um, um, I covered the the GPU training and all of those as well. So if you wanted to see me walk through the GPU training, um, uh, then it'll be included in that. Um, and if you want more details on how to manage Jupyter Lab with Conda and PIP, then there's a talk on JupyterCon 2020 on that. Um, I'm tired. I don't know about you guys, but it's almost five o'clock. <laughs> so I, uh, with that, so I don't have anything else to say. Um, and uh, so if there's any questions, then um, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if not, we can call it a day. So um, Salma, are there any upcoming training or workshop for programming in Python? How do I get notifications? So yes. Um, so there is a workshop next Tuesday afternoon on an introduction to programming in Python. And um, I, I would think the same place where you learned about to register for this workshop, because all the registration links and everything went out in the same announcement. Um, and there's been even more kind of announcements about it. Um, but you will, in any case, tomorrow when we send the, the link to the recording, there will be links to register for next week's workshop. So if you're interested in registering for next week's workshop, then look for the registration links that will come around tomorrow. Um, uh, thank you, Abir, uh, for sharing um, the link to the workshop. And or sorry, the, the link to the PDF that has the registration links, I can't even think straight, for the workshops next week and the weeks after that. So as far as I'm aware, there is space in the remaining workshops. It's starting to fill up, um, particularly the Python one, because it tends to be very popular. Um, so please uh, you know, don't wait. So once you get the registration link, either from that PDF or, or again tomorrow, then please please register. Um, and then I hope to see you next week. Okay. Thank you guys so much for spending four hours. I know four hours is a long time uh, uh, out of a, it's a half a day to, to give to this. So I appreciate your uh, spending the time to, to learn about Conda this afternoon.
Okay. I'll hang around just for a few minutes uh, as people leave um, in case anybody has questions. Um, but otherwise, I'll see you guys uh, next week. Okay, guys, it doesn't look like there's any questions, so I'll see you, uh, see you next week.